Chapter 6 Miles to Go 39 The bus rumbled to a stop in a gravel parking lot just off the road. LB, the driver announced through hissy static over the speakers. Five minute break. The door at the front creaked open and the driver and a couple of other people got out. It was raining. Clouds covered the world from one edge of the sky to the other, and they were so dark gray they were almost black. Wind pushed and pulled at the trees. Shelby was still asleep against my shoulder, but this was my stop. Mine and Bo's. The last few miles, while she was sleeping, I'd written her a little note. It was in three lines of five syllables, then seven, then five. It was mostly about being mad. Well, about not being mad. I slipped it into her hand. She licked her lips and her fingers closed around it and her head rolled back against the seat and off my shoulder. I stood up, grabbed the handle of Bo's duffel and slid past her and out into the aisle. Her brother was sitting, looking out the window. Muffled sounds of angry music seeped out of his earphones. I reached over and yanked the closest one out of his ear. His gaze snapped over to me. Pay attention to her, you stupid jerk, I said. His mouth stayed open in an O of surprise. I walked off the bus. The town of Elby wasn't much. A curve in the two-lane highway, some wet-looking houses, a crummy motel next to a gas station. An old train car off the tracks had been turned into a restaurant. My stomach went back and forth between starving and pukey. I had to try and eat. Rain drizzled around me, poking at the puddles in the gravel. My head was a broken drum that was still getting pounded with a mallet. I kept one eye closed. My head hurt so bad. While Bo ran around in the shadows of the trees, sniffing and going to the bathroom, I fished the pills out of my coat pocket. The bottle rattled in my hand, promising me a break from my headache but I knew the pills would make me sick again. Another meal lost down a toilet, and I needed to eat. I needed to be strong. I chewed on my tongue, then pressed and twisted the lid off the bottle. Before I could change my mind, I flipped the bottle over and dumped it out. The round little white pills dropped like hard, heavy snowflakes. They almost glowed they were so bright in the dark world of the parking lot. They fell with little splashes into a muddy puddle at my feet. I'd have to take the pain from here on out. It wouldn't kill me. Well, it would, but that was kind of the point. That's the truth. The waitress in the railroad car was, so busy, was too busy to ask too many questions. I told her my mom was sleeping in the motel across the street, and she pulled a pen out of her hair and asked me what I wanted to eat. The food was good, and I kept it down chewing through my headache. Bo sat still like a saint in the duffel at my feet. The meal was salty and hot, and I slipped him as many bites as I could. While I waited for my change, I looked out the train car window through the rain to the gas station. One car was filling up at the pump. A couple of people with big hiking backpacks stood against the wall, just out of the rain. In a little while, a shuttle bus would pull up to take people to the mountain. It was the last part of my trip that I wouldn't be walking, according to my plan, anyway. But in my plan, I had the 50 bucks for the shuttle ride. I could ask the hikers to give me some money, but I didn't want to. I was doing this thing all the way. I didn't need anybody's help. I didn't want anybody's help. And they'd be suspicious anyway. Why would a kid want to go up a mountain all by himself? You could die up there. I grabbed my change when the waitress brought it and walked across the street to the gas station. I didn't really have much of a plan, but I knew where I was going, and I knew how to get there. That was my plan. I leaned against the wall a little ways down from the hikers. They were a young couple, like in their 20s. They both had long hair and bandanas around their necks. The guy looked over at me. You going to paradise? He asked. Yeah, I said. I waited for his next question and wondered what lie I'd come up with. But the guy just nodded. Cool, man, he said. Shuttle should be here any minute. 
While we waited in the gloomy afternoon, several more people showed up and joined us. An older couple with no climbing gear but three cameras and a pair of binoculars. A family with two little kids that ran around and screamed. An old guy with a walking stick who was so lean and healthy looking, he looked like he could walk a thousand miles without hardly noticing. I got lost in the crowd. I liked it. I sat down on the ground against the wall and petted Bo through the duffel. When the shuttle bus pulled up, there was a flurry of activity. Tickets and money were passed back and forth. Backpacks were handed over and hoisted aboard. The driver walked around with a clipboard. He looked busy and grumpy. I picked my moment. He was around the back of the bus, muscling a heavy backpack into the trunk. I grabbed my duffel and slipped through the people still standing outside and up the steps onto the bus. I wanted to sit in the back, away from the driver, but it was only a little half bus, and the only spots with two seats still open were right near the front. I needed room for Bo and his duffel. I plopped down against the window with Bo on the aisle seat beside me and tried to look unimportant. The rest of the passengers filled the other seats around me. All right, the driver called out, climbing aboard and closing the door. Off we go to Paradise Visitor Center in Mount Rainier National Park, gateway to the mountain herself. Hope none of you was planning to climb her too soon. We're at the front end of a nasty storm. The bus engine thrummed to life and lurched into gear. We started moving. Short stop at Ashford, and then we'll be on to Paradise in about an hour. I'd made it. One little shuttle ride, and I'd be at the mountain. I'd be at the mountain. And then, and then, my stomach knotted up again. I could feel my heartbeat pulsing in my neck. My mouth watered, then went dry. My breaths came short and fast. I shook my head and blinked hard two, three, four times. My fingernails dug into my palms. Forget it, I whispered through tight teeth. Forget it. Here's what I don't get. Why everyone makes such a big deal out of dying. Dying and living, it's all such a mess. That's the truth. It made me mad. A sad kind of angry. Tangled all up in my feelings was a memory. I closed my eyes and held the memory in my mind like a smooth river stone. I was sick again. Jesse was visiting me, which was nice. I got so bored and lonely when I was sick. I was in bed, Bo curled up beside me like he always has. My mom, who was normally a total clean freak about something like a dog in bed, never shooed him down. She let him stay with me where he belonged. Jesse said something about me being too quiet. Oh, he's always quiet, my mom said rubbing my forehead with her soft fingers. She was beside me, too, like Bo. She always was. He's always been so quiet and thoughtful. Jessie shook her head. We were just little kids still, seven years old. No, she said in that serious little kid way. Not like that. More like scared. Little kids are dumb. They'll just say whatever stupid thing comes into their head, no matter how true it is no matter how sad it'll make someone's mom. Scared? My mom said with a nervous laugh. Her fingers dropped to my shoulder and gave it a gentle squeeze. What would he be scared of? Jessie's voice got hushed and whispery. Maybe he's afraid of dying, she said, her eyes solemn and teary. She wasn't being mean or rude. She just didn't know any better. But I heard my mom swallow, saw her head jerk a little. I knew that if I looked up, her eyes would be teary too. I didn't look up. My mom started to speak. Oh, Jess, that's a silly thing to say. That's just... But I interrupted her. I am, I said. I'm afraid of dying. My mom's cool fingers rubbed softly on my hot forehead. I could hear her breathing through her nose. I could almost hear words rising into her mouth and then being swallowed back down as she waited for the right ones. Being afraid is no way to be, honey, she said at last. I, I know it's hard, baby, but there's no use in being afraid. Her eyes dropped down to Bo in my lap, 
his ribs rising and falling in his sleep. Look at Beau, she said. Do you think he'd let anything happen to you? Do you think he'd ever let you be by yourself or fight something alone? No, I answered in my hoarse voice. He wouldn't. He's the best, but dogs die, Mom. Dogs die. There was another silence. My fears and my sadness were all knotted up inside me. Yes, my mom responded after a moment. Dogs die, but dogs live too. Right up until they die, they live. They live brave, beautiful lives. They protect their families and love us and make our lives a little brighter. And they don't waste time being afraid of tomorrow. Look at him now, honey. All three of us looked down at the dog asleep beside his sick boy. I scratched him behind his sleeping ears. He's not afraid of anything, she continued. Not worrying about anything. Just living his life for now. Just happy being here now with you. He's a good dog. He was a good dog. I reached down and patted him, laying in a duffel on a bus next to his sick boy. Now it was my turn. My turn to live a brave and beautiful life. My turn to live right up until I die. But I couldn't get my own words out of my head. Dogs die. I was so deep in my memory that I hardly noticed the bus pull over in front of a little hotel and cafe by the side of the road. Ashford, folks, the driver called out, opening the bus door and killing the engine. Couple minutes here. Some more folks getting on. I let my head fall back against the seat to wait. I was tired down into the center of my bones. But before my eyes could drop shut, the driver turned around and looked right at me and growled through his teeth. I know what you're doing, kid. Get off my bus. Now. <laughs>